Shalom, I am Valerie Moody of Hebrew Discovery Ministries. Welcome. Today we are talking about the struggle between the Hebrews and the Greeks. There is a clash between these two cultures, and it affects how we read our Bible. I'm committed to bringing you a Hebraic perspective to our faith and to our scriptures so that we understand the Bible the way it was actually written. It's always right to be more familiar with God's Word. We want to embrace the Bible's true message message because that message brings us life. Humanly speaking, the Bible reflects a Hebrew culture and a Hebrew perspective. Hebrew thinking is really the opposite of Greek thinking. Scripture reflects the Hebrew culture, which is the opposite of the Greek culture. So if we read Scripture using only a Greek mindset, we will always miss part of what the Bible is actually saying. The stories that shaped the Hebrew people came from Scripture, while the stories that shaped the ancient Greeks came from fantasies and mythology. Now, the Hebrew religion is based on Scripture. It's based on things that actually happened. And it promotes teshuva, which means, uh, well, one way that we could say that is keeping short, short accounts with God. But teshuva literally is to turn around and go back. Turn around and go back to God. When we allow His Spirit to keep us on a short leash, we run to make it right with Him. We run back to Him and we make it right. And that's the idea of teshuva. We just don't see this in the ancient Greek religion. And everything about the ancient Greek civilization impacts our world today. It has impact, impacted the entire known world for at least 2,300 years. Now, the prophets in the Bible often cried, woe is me. They wanted people to repent. And when they were saying, woe is me, it was never from a sense of hopelessness. You know, the, the Greek prophets believed in fate. They talked about fate, that even God himself, if, if the one single superior God existed, and it didn't for the Greeks, there were multiple gods, but if there was a supreme God like Zeus, even that God had to submit to fate. We just don't see this in the Hebrew Bible. God is su the supreme creator of all things, and the Hebrew prophets don't talk about fate. They talk about teshuva. They talk about returning to God. Because what the Hebrew prophets taught was that if you repent, if we repent, we are able to change the prophetic uh, the prophetically told destruction that that is pronounced, that is coming, that teshuva can change prophecy. That's what the Hebrew prophets taught us in Scripture. And so when the Hebrew prophets are saying, woe is me, they said that not because there was no hope, they did not have hopelessness, they said that because because they were carrying the weight of their prophetic message. That message was heavy for them. They often knew what, that God was going to bring judgment and what that judgment would look like. It was very heavy to have that knowledge. Yet they always hoped in God's mercy. And that's the picture that they give us in the Hebrew Bible. We always can hope in God's mercy. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people will humble themselves, I will heal their land. So we always hope in God's mercy, even when judgment has been pronounced. So the Hebrew prophets believed in individual repentance or teshuva. They also believed in national repentance and teshuva. And they believed that teshuva could change a prophetic outcome. Teshuva means to turn around and go back. If a person returned to God, they could affect prophecy. So let's just read this in Zephaniah 2, 2 through 3. Zephaniah 2, 2 through 3 states, Before the decree takes effect, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. So God is responding in this passage to righteousness and humility. He 
is offering protection in the day of his wrath, in the day of his anger, here in Zephaniah 2, 2 and 3. But it's based on righteousness and humility. It's based on repentance and teshuva. So repentance has the potential to modify Hebrew prophecy in the Bible. When we read in Daniel chapter 4, and Daniel's interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the great tree that was rooted in the ground and how the tree was felled, that, uh, that God had proclaimed that he, was, that he would be covered with the dew of heaven. He was going to live among the animals for seven times or seven years. Daniel interpreted that, and he was terrified by that interpretation, but he interpreted that dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And then what did Daniel say? Daniel recommended Teshuva. He said, and now, O king, repent, honor the God of heaven, recognize him, and perhaps this prophecy will be taken from you and you will not have to go through this. That's exactly what Daniel told him because in the Hebraic nature of scripture, our repentance or teshuva can modify prophecy. Now, because the Hebrew Bible is a book of actions, God wants to see actions from us. The Hebrew people have always believed in the interaction between God and men. Therefore, if they focused on God in repentance and humility, God would respond. Now, even the wicked king Ahab, or Ahab, we know him as Ahab, he turned, uh, he turned God away from some judgment. Ahab's biblical record is anything but complimentary. Scripture says that he did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than all the kings of Israel before him. He married Jezebel, Itzabel, a foreign princess who worshipped Baal. He built a pagan altar, a pagan temple, an Asherah pole, and he worshipped many idols himself. Queen Jezebel persecuted God's prophets, and yet Ahab did nothing to stop her. The king wanted a vineyard that was located next to the palace, a vineyard that belonged to Navot, but the Torah did not allow Navot to sell the tribal land of his ancestors. Scripture told him, don't do this. Don't sell tribal land. It has to stay in your tribe. It has to stay in your family. So King Ahab pouted. And Jezebel took matters into her own hands. She conspired with the rabble rousers to falsely accuse this innocent man in a dramatic public trial. And after the people stoned Navot to death, which that's what they did in 1 Kings 21, 13, then she seized his vineyard and she gave it to King Ahab. Was this wifely devotion? Perhaps, but she violated nearly all of the Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. The Ten Commandments are the Ten Words. She violated nearly every one of them in this gruesome event. Jezebel tore down a vineyard which took generations to develop, and she planted an herb garden that grows in a season. This is what happened here. Ahab's household exchanged something valuable for something worthless. When Elijah attempted to correct him, King Ahab called Elijah the troubler of Israel. So Ahab was extremely wicked. But after all of this, Ahab put on sackcloth and he humbled himself. He did teshuva before God. And so God responded after all of that. God responded in 1 Kings 21, 27 through 29 by saying that he would postpone judgment on Ahab until the reign of his sons. He would not bring that judgment during Ahab's lifetime because Ahab did teshuva. So the Hebrews see that God interacts with men, and God responds when men repent. Now, the ancient Greeks did not believe in hope as much as they believed in fate. We talked about that just a little bit earlier. Fate was stronger than any Greek God. For the Greeks, history was a series of present moments that disappeared forever and could not be changed. They were fixed by the passage of time, and time destroyed everything. 
Now, Greek religion was far removed from the beliefs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three patriarchs of the Hebrew people. The mythology of the ancient Greeks encouraged a type of fatalism. Their, pro their prophets were fatalistic. For the Greeks, fate was stronger than the gods, and individuals could not change fate. Not even the gods could change fate. Their gods did not make covenants with the people, as the God of the Bible did with the Hebrews. No matter what anyone attempted to do, the Greek prophecies would occur because fate was in control. The Greek people would not be protected. They were subjected to fate. Now, that is part of the Greek religion that's far removed from uh, the beliefs that we see in the Hebrew Bible. Now, a perverted offshoot of false Greek religion was that sexual behavior was not tied to any religious belief. Sexual immorality, therefore, was encouraged in ancient Greece, particularly relationships between older men and young boys. Now, this sounds extremely perverted today, but this was a common practice in the ancient Greek civilization. The Greeks could justify their sexual indulgences because in the view of their philosophers, the physical body was not important. It was not part of their salvation. The body did not play a role in salvation. Therefore, the body was free to indulge in pleasure with no eternal consequences. In contrast to the Greek abandonment to sensual pleasure, the Hebrews believed that the body was the temple of God's Ruach HaKodesh. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. And this passage states this, Don't you know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Greek indulgences plagued Israel through Hellenistic Jews. And it was a plague. We can see that in the Hebrew Bible, even in the Brit Hadashah, or New Testament, that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in Greek understanding, the body had absolutely nothing to do with eternity, nothing to do with salvation. They could do whatever they wanted to. And so these two uh, views were diametrically opposed. Now, Israel became plagued by this Greek understanding through the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, that went over to the Greek philosophy and Greek religion. They were called Hellenistic Jews. And so there was a, a problem there. Since Jews, or some of the Jews rather, compromised with Greek values, that, and uh, these values were opposed to the Hebrew scriptures that they had been raised with. Hebrew scri scriptures stress cleanliness before God, and these Hellenistic Jews were willing to give that up. Now, immersing in a mikvah or ritual bath is not only prescribed in the Torah, it's a symbol of being clean before God. It reminded the Hebrew people how vital it was to approach God with pure, undefiled bodies when they came to worship Him. At the temple, the priests would wash their hands and feet continually because Exodus 30 verse 20 told them that they should wash with water when they approach the altar to minister to God. Now, even today, religious Jews wash their hands at a public basin, which, uh, which has been placed there in the Kotel Plaza before the Western Wall. And this practice of washing the hands before they approach the wall to pray is called netalat, Yadayim. The hand washing ceremony is, uh, is based on Exodus 30, verse 20. They want to wash their hands even before they approach the wall to pray and bring their offerings to God. Since prayer is seen as a kind of sacrifice on the altar, they are able to apply Exodus 30, 20, and that's why they wash their hands before they go to prayer at the Western Wall. They're bringing clean hands and a clean heart to God. It was more challenging for Israel 
when the Greeks were ruling the world than it is today, of course. There was a moral war raging at that time in the ancient world. That war was started by Alexander the Great, who spread Greek philosophy and Greek ideas across the civilized world. Those Greek ideas were found in every nation. About two centuries before the destruction of the temple, Greek culture dominated the Hebrew culture. Hebrews were first exposed to the Greek culture in Alexandria in Egypt. That was a Greek city there, and there were a lot of Hebrew people who lived there. And uh, they were first exposed to Greek ideas and Greek learning at that time. Now, Alexandrian Greeks believed that their philosophy and their religion could transform the entire world, and in some ways it did. This bustling international city contained one of the largest concentrations of Jewish people outside of Israel, and it was here that the Hebrews began to adopt Greek culture, thinking, and behavior. As a result, they became Hellenized, Greek-thinking Jews. Now, Alexandria also contained one of the largest libraries in the world, the Royal Library of Alexandria. It held more than 500,000 scrolls. Of course, it was destroyed in the 7th century. Um, in the Nicolas Cage movie, however, called National Treasure, I like to pretend that part of that movie is true because in that movie, the hero and the heroine discover the ancient scrolls from the library at Alexandria. And so uh, we know that those scrolls were actually burned. It took six months to burn all the scrolls there. And with those scrolls went a lot of knowledge and information and uh, recordings about the ancient world. It was a great loss. But at least in that movie, they found the scrolls again. Well, people gathered at that library, that library that held these scrolls, and it was in those corridors of learning that the Hebrew people became uh, enthralled with Greek mythology and philosophy and Greek ideas. You know, Greek mythology was symbolic and allegorical, pointing from the ordinary, mundane event to some great spiritual truth. That's what allegory is. And uh, that came from Greek mythology. And so the Hebrew people were exposed to that at that time. And in some ways, that's opposed to the Hebrew Bible. And unfortunately, the early church adopted some of that Greek allegory, and it made its way into the belief of, of some New Testament believers. So these Grecian ideas were finding their way even to Israel. And by the year 175 BCE, even the high priest in Jerusalem fell under the sway of Hellenization and Greek thinking. There was a gymnasium built in Jerusalem. As, and as, as incredible as it seems, the holy city of Jerusalem was declared to be a Greek city at that time. So this was the climate when a cruel Greek dictator, Antiochus Epiphanes, came on the scene. He began to rule Israel in the year 171 BCE, and he forced a Greek lifestyle on Israel in an unusually cruel way. He cut out tongues of people who refused to eat pork. He cut off hands and feet of the Hebrews who refused to violate the Torah. And um, he boiled them in oil. He fried them in frying pans. Some of the horrible things that he did are recorded in the books of Maccabees in the Apocrypha. Those are simply historical books that date back to that time, and they tell us what this cruel Greek dictator did in the land of Israel. Now, Antiochus also introduced Greek philosophy, a Greek culture and lifestyle. He wanted everyone to adopt this lifestyle and culture. He introduced Greek wisdom and entertainment and even athletic sports to Israel because we don't see a lot of athletic sports in the Bible. So this was not a country that was given to the Olympics or to athletic sports. That came out of ancient Greece. So Antiochus was introducing this. These were f foreign ideas and foreign practices for the Hebrew people, but he brought this into Israel. Now, the ancient Greek 
athletes competed in the nude. If we take a look at the word gymnasium, it comes from the Greek word gymnos. Gymnos actually means naked, and this indicates that the foundation of the athletic sporting events in Greece was a world apart from today's athletic sports. In that day, the Greek athletes all of the Greek culture worshipped the human body, and the Greek athletes were competing in the nude. The body was unclothed in those sporting events for the sake of admiring and worshipping the human body, because in the view of the ancient Greeks, man could master nature, he could master all the forces in the universe, he could do that through his great thinking and through his mind, and therefore they were celebrating men, and that included celebrating the human body, and so in athletic sporting events, the men wore no clothes. Now the Hebrew men, some young Hebrew men dreamed of participating in these athletic events. They wanted to enter the Olympics and win gold medals and find acceptance in the world outside of Israel. But they were handicapped by their circumcisions because they were circumcised according to the Torah. Their uncircumcised Greek counterparts were competing in the nude. And so to, in order to conform to the Greek image, Hebrew men had their circumcisions surgically mutilated so they could appear to be Greek or Greek-like in the Greek stadium. They wanted to resemble the uncircumcised Greek athletes. And so that's what they did. And even the first century historian Josephus wrote about this practice, the practice of Hebrew athletes to conceal their circumcisions and have this surgical mutilation. In his book, the Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus wrote this. They concealed the circumcision of their genitals in order to be Greeks even when they had taken off their clothing. So the, the, uh, here is a, a, a historian outside of Scripture recording this practice for us, and this is really a, kind of a sad time in Israel's history. The classic Hebrew literature called this surgical mutilation epiplasm. And at one time in Israel's history, many men employed epiplasm so that they could be accepted in the Greek world. This hardly makes sense to us today, but this was a practice in the first century at the time when Josephus lived. Hebrew males renounced their faith, which was symbolized by circumcision, and they turned to Hellenism, which was symbolized by the athletic sports and the Olympic Games. And this practice this desire of gaining approval in the Greek arena. Now, artwork on ancient Greek pottery, I minored in art history years ago in college. I've got many hours of college art history. And so I've seen many of those antique uh, Greek pots. There are some beautiful amphora and other objects that have come down to us from the ancient Greek civilization. But often they're adorned with nude men competing in some event, like a foot racing or javelin throwing or discus throwing or something like that. And when I saw those, I didn't realize at the time that those were actually historical records of real events that took place. I thought it was just a stylistic, artistic technique. I had no clue, though, that was a history record of something that was really taking place, that Greek athletes actually did compete in the nude in their sporting events. Now, the Olympic Games were also played nude. They were begun in the year 776. All Greek athletic competitions were actually played as an act of worship to Zeus, and uh, Zeus, Apollo, and Poseidon. And the Ap Olympic Games specifically honored Zeus on Mount Olympia. That's where the the Olympic Games draws its name, and on Mount Olympia, that's where the major temples to Zeus were located. And so during the athletic games, the Olympic Games specifically, the games stopped temporarily while the producers of the event could sacrifice a hundred oxen to Zeus. And so these athletic sporting events were honoring Greek gods. That's why they were uh, nude events, that's why they were 
played in the way that they were and why they included sacrifices on pagan altars to Greek gods, particularly Zeus, on Mount Olympia. This is the history of the Olympic Games. Uh, kind of an unfortunate history. And so we really still see this even today because athletic, athletes parade in, they come in in their majesty, and there are torch bearers that bear light, uh, the torch of Olympia, and of course the torch of Olympia is Zeus. And they light that flame, and it's something that is a carryover from 2,700 years ago in the ancient Greek civilization the Olympic Games were played to honor Zeus. And so this was the world that the first century Hebrews were struggling with, and really even the first century believers were struggling with Greek ideas, and they were struggling against Hellenism. They were struggling to stay true to the Torah and true to the God of Israel. And so th that struggle with Greek thinking has been out there for centuries. It still exists today. It has not gone away. And so this is the, the kind of thing that we're dealing with when we look at the differences between Hebrew thinking and Greek thinking. I'll share more with you as soon as we come back. I'm Valerie Moody of Hebrew Discovery Ministries. You're watching the Hebraic Roots Network. This network is the vision of many Hebrew Roots teachers and the tireless efforts of a few precious servants of God. Please support the Hebraic Roots Network to keep solid biblical teaching on the internet. We are a network of people working together to lead you to the Heavenly Father and to Yeshua, His Messiah King. We can only do this as a team, and you are part of that team. Please pray for the network and consider sending your financial support to the Hebraic Roots Network. Shalom and welcome back. I'm Valerie Moody and we've been talking about the ancient Greek lifestyle and how uh, the Hebrews of the first century had to fight against this and struggle with this. And in many ways, believers are struggling today with the Greek ideals that are all around us, particularly if we were born in a Western nation, because Western nations have been influenced by the ancient Greek culture. Now, one of the things that we were sharing right before the break was that the Greek athletic events were... Uh, were played in the nude. They were played as worship events for Zeus, for Apollo, and for Poseidon, these Greek gods. In the middle of those games, they sacrificed a hundred oxen to Zeus. This history is out there. Anyone can go out and read this even on Wikipedia. And um, this is just common history. And so, unfortunately, this is the, the civilization, this is the culture that was impacting the Hellenistic Jews. There were some Hebrew people that were selling out to these Greek ideals, even in the first century and also the first century uh, BCE, the second century BCE, about 160 years before Yeshua was born. Antiochus Epiphanes came in and he built a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was care somehow, somehow was declared to be a Greek city of all things about 175 BCE. Really an unfortunate time in the history of Israel and really unfortunate even for us today. So this is what we have been talking about and how the athletes, the word gymnasium is a Greek word. It comes from the word gymnos and gymnos means naked. The Greeks believed that man was superior over nature. He could conquer the universe simply by his intellect, and therefore they admired man, and they admired man's body, and they were able to, to show this body in their athletic games because all the events were played nude. And the Hebrew men, uh, the young men particularly, 
Hebrews who wanted to, who were strong and they wanted to show that they could compete with those Greek athletes, had to have their circumcision sur surgically mutilated to be able to go into the Greek arena and be accepted in that world. And Josephus has also written about this. So this is what we covered in the first half. Now we need to go on because there is a great struggle between the, the Hebraic lifestyle and the Greek lifestyle. Now the Greek games showcased foot races and discus and javelin throwing, long jumping, wrestling and boxing. And although the athletes uh, today no longer compete in the nude, Onlook, onlookers still admire their muscular physique and their athletic prowess in these in the Olympic Games. They're broadcast all across the world today, but their foundation is as a worship event for Zeus. And so that's the history of the Olympic Games. The athletic contests were religious festivals that brought honor to Zeus. The Greeks sacrificed 100 oxen to Zeus in the middle of the games. We had talked about that. And, um, and so athletes were competing as individuals, however. That's one difference from today. They were not competing on teams. They were competing individually. And these were accepted across the world. War stopped so people could travel to the Olympic Games. Even, uh, even generals of armies were not able to continue fighting during the Olympic Games so that everyone on Earth could travel to these events. So the popularity of the Olympic Games today has a long and colorful history dating back 2,700 years. Now, the Greeks would schedule at least one athletic competition per year, but the oldest and most prominent, of course, are the Olympic Games, which were played on Olympia, the mountaintop, uh, that mountaintop of Olympia where the main temples to Zeus were located. Now, Olympia attracted so many visitors that it became home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a giant, over 40 foot tall, gold and ivory statue of Zeus. He was enthroned there on Mount Olympia, and people could go up a spiral staircase to a second floor of the temple and even see the statue from a, a higher level. And so, this was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was there at Mount Olympia, and the people coming to the Olympic Games could see this statue. So the games, uh, as I said, were so revered that even wars ceased so that people could come from to the games from everywhere. They came from Spain and Italy and Libya and Egypt and the Ukraine and Turkey. Legal disputes were forbidden during the games, so not even attorneys or lawyers could threaten these important athletic competitions. Now, not all athletes were in the ancient Greek games were diligent to follow the Olympic code of excellence. They were cheating, and when the athletes cheated, they were fined, and the fines were used to make bronze statues of Zeus. These statues of Zeus were constructed with the fine money that athletes had to pay if they were cheating in the games. And the statues, uh, these bronze statues, were lining the, the roadway that led into the main opening into the Olympic Stadium, and each statue had a standard attached to the hand in the statue. You know, these were nude figures of Zeus, but he stood up and one hand was raised up and there was a standard in that hand, and in that standard they could attach a parchment or a, their version of paper where they wrote out what the athlete's crimes were. So there was a, it was public disgrace to have have for an athlete to have his name there and to tell what he did to cheat in Greek, uh, in some Greek athletic sporting event. And this, uh, they have, these statues still exist today. They're in museums. I've, I've seen an entire line of these statues. So they were lined up leading into the Olympic Stadium to announce violations of the Code of Excellence. 
So they had some ethics as part of what they were doing, in spite of the fact that it was a worship event to Zeus and the athletes were competing in the nude. Now, the whole world, with the exception of Israel, believed the games to be the world's greatest standard of individual achievement and excellence. Israel did not completely buy off on that. The Greek games honored their mythological gods, while the Hebrews were honoring the God of heaven and earth. The Greeks were holding nude athletic events for Zeus, while the Hebrews were celebrating the feast days in the Bible. You can see there's a real uh, dichotomy here. There's, a, there's a, a complete opposite going on here. One is borders on the immoral, and one is absolutely based on scripture and morality and cleanness before God. Now, the Hebrew people uh, did not, they did not uh, require Greek fairy tales or nude athletic events to be incorporated into their culture. They simply sought to live out by the Bible in Halakha. They knew the God of the Bible and they worshiped him. They honored him and they wanted to have a biblical lifestyle, a biblical Halakha. And so Israel was not buying off on all of this. Only a few Hellenistic Jews went over to the Greek side and they compromised their beliefs in this way. Now, the, Israel didn't need Greek fairy tales. They had scripture. And scripture, of course, is not fairy tales, but it records actual historical events and reveals the actions of God on behalf of men. It reveals God in the real world. The heroes of the Bible did not change like the Greek gods in mythology. The Greek gods were constantly changing. And so the stories and characters of scripture are fixed by history. No new plot lines were, have been developed in scripture. After the first century, scripture is set and God's word is true. It's right. It's established. It's complete and we can trust it. And only the serpent, who is a symbol of the evil one, the serpent in Ganin, Eden, for, for instance, a symbol of the evil, evil one, he's the one who is challenging God's word, and he does it in every generation. In one way or another, that serpent surfaces in every generation to contend with the word of God. Often the battle is not between the forces of light and darkness, but between Hebrew thinking and Greek thinking. Now, this is the reason I wrote the workbook, My Big Fat Greek Mindset. I wrote this so that we could understand what Greek thinking is. Greek thinking, Greek philosophy, Greek culture, Greek religion, uh, even the Greek language, which reflects so much of what they believe. This is why I wrote the book, so that we could recognize the Greek influences in our culture and society, and also, by comparison, recognize what the Hebrew culture is and the Hebrew language, the Hebrew religion, Hebrew faith, the Hebrew perspective toward life. It also offers solutions to Greek thinking, which is wonderful. It comes with discussion, question, discussion questions to, to lead you. If you decide to study the book with a group, it will help you lead discussion in a group. Or you can use it as a personal study tool. But all of this information is contained in that workbook. It's a wonderful asset for any library. It's carried in the HRN marketplace. You can get it there. And it will help us in our battle against Greek thinking. Now, we have to resist our big, fat Greek mindsets to understand and embrace Hebrew roots or a Hebraic-style faith. This book was written to help us do that, to resist Greek thinking. Now, it's hard to resist Greek thinking because it's all around us. It's, it is much easier to resist ancient Greek theology because ancient Greek theology was based on a polytheism, many gods. We can, we can resist that idea because this seems very foreign and far removed from our society today. So we can resist that, but it's much more difficult to resist Greek thinking. The Greeks, of course, believed in many gods and goddesses. There was actually a hierarchy of deities with Zeus 
being the king of all the gods. He was over all the gods, supreme over all the others. But polytheism was exactly the type of religious perspective that the God of Israel was opposed to. When, Bible, when the Bible was still being written, the Greek civilization, uh, the beginnings of, the, of, of their society and the Olympic Games, which started in the 8th century BCE, even at the time of Hezekiah, the, the Greek civilization was unfolding and developing and, and being refined and tuned, even as the Bible was being written. And so the God of Scripture is absolutely opposed to these things. We know that God is the king over nature, over creation, and over man, and he's jealous of other gods. We read this in Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24, so let's go and read this passage. Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 24 states, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and you make an engraved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a devouring fire, a jealous God. Now, this passage in Deuteronomy was an exhortation to be faithful to the God of the Bible. In contrast to this, the Greeks had statues of mythological gods, make-believe gods. They were worshiping statues. At the same time, the Bible, the Torah said, don't make statues, don't make idols, don't worship graven images. So we can see right there, there's a struggle between Greek thinking and the Hebrew Bible. Now, the Greeks encouraged the worship of their favorite deities, and they described how important it was to appease them. If human actions did not appease or please the Greek gods, then they would lose the gods' protection, favor, and blessings. But if they did appease their gods, then, the, then protection and blessing would be sure to follow. The gods played favorites among the people, according to Greek mythology. Yet the, the Greek gods made life miserable for those that they didn't like. Now, in sharp contrast to the Greek mythological gods, the Hebrew God was no respecter of persons. Rabbi Paul said that, that God was no respecter of persons, and so uh, the God of Scripture could be trusted, that God showed no partiality. And, of course, Rabbi Paul was quoting the Torah when he said this. So let's go and read Deuteronomy 10, 17, and 18. This passage explains this. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. What we know from this passage in the Torah is that the God of Scripture cannot be bribed. He's not partial. He does not show partiality because he provides protection for everyone. The fatherless and the widow, the, even the foreigner who sojourns with Israel as well has a protection. He comes under the corner of the robe, so to speak, of the God of Israel. Now, the Olympian gods claimed to be the supreme powers over nature. Zeus uh, whose name means bright sky and heaven, was the most powerful god in Greece. He ruled the sky. He ruled the heavens, and he guaranteed order in the universe. Thunder and lightning during a rainstorm in the minds of those Greek people meant that Zeus was angry, but when Zeus was happy, it was sunny outside. He gladly dispatched his son Apollo to bring the sun in his chariot, and so this, is, this was part of Greek mythology. Poseidon, of course, ruled over the sea and over earthquakes. 
Hades projected his power through the realms of death and the underworld. Hades was the brother of Zeus in mythology. His realm was originally called the place of Hades. Now the Greeks believed in an underworld where human spirits went after death. It was commonly believed that if a funeral were never performed, then a person's spirit would never actually find rest in the underworld. It would haunt the earth forever. And so that's where that idea comes from. We owe that to the ancient Greeks. But the Greek view of the underworld was also constantly changing. It wasn't, it wasn't established and true and real like the precepts in the Bible. The New Testament uses the, actually uses the Greek term Hades in Matthew 11.23 and Matthew 16.18. It appears also in Luke 10.15 and Luke 16, 23. It's in Acts 2, 27 and 2, 31. It's also in the book of Revelation in 1, 18, 6, 8, and finally in Revelation 20, verses 13 and 14. So the Greek translation of the, the Brit Hadashah, or New Testament, uses this term Hades, but it actually corresponds to the Hebrew word Sheol in the Old Testament Tanakh. So that is actually what is meant there, but they're using the word Hades in a Greek translation. And of course, that came to us in English as the word Hades. In the Hebrew Bible, though, Sheol means the underworld, uh, the underworld place of no return. But according to Psalm 16, verse 10, Sheol is still a place where God is God does not abandon the righteous, because that's what that verse says in Psalm 16. Now, in the Greek religion, the underworld contained a darker realm called Tartarus. It was a place of great torment for the damned. And this Greek word also appears in some Bible translations in 2 Peter verse 2, 4. So ancient Greece was one of the... Uh, had so much mythological understanding. They had such a hierarchy of gods and and uh, the the um, the afterlife and the underworld, <clears throat> and this greatly affected uh, the people. This was the culture and the understanding that the Hebrew people had to resist and to fight based on scripture. Ancient Greece <clears throat> was so interesting. Uh, philosophy was born there. Philosophers uh, were prosperous there. And the reason for that is that ancient Greece was one of the first cultures that was wealthy enough and advanced enough for people to sit and contemplate difficult topics for a living. Greek mythology and religion and philosophy prospered and thrived in this kind of atmosphere there, they developed the idea of the 12 primary Olympian gods. And then, of course, each city state had its own god, which added to the group of gods. And even Alexander the Great was worshipped as a god. At times, the Greek gods would oppose one another in wars. They had love affairs with human beings and produced supernatural offspring. Um, in war, some Greek gods would would uh, re would fight other Greek gods. That's what we find in the Trojan War, and of course, sacrifice was how these gods were appeased. Very interesting society. Sacrifice was that common expression of worship for the uh, for the Greek gods. People were sacrificing sheep and goats and bulls and pigs and sometimes human beings on their pagan altars. Occasionally, worshipers would leave some kind of object or a piece of jewelry that was very meaningful for them, something valuable that they would leave it there on the altar. Now, in Acts 15, 28 through 29, we learn about, uh, about resisting this. This passage states, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourself free from such things, you will do well. Now, what's really going on in this passage is that the, the bulls and the goats and, that were being sacrificed 
to these Greek gods on these pagan altars in these Greek temples, that meat was finding its way into the marketplace. After the sacrifice was was made for Zeus or some other Greek god, then the meat was sold in the marketplace, and these first century believers were buying meat that had been sacrificed to idols Sometimes unknowingly, but if they asked and learned that the meat in the marketplace had been sacrificed to idols, this council in Jerusalem there in Acts 15 is saying, don't eat that meat. Don't eat meat that's been sacrificed to Greek idols. So the apostles were warning those first century believers, avoid eating meat that had been sacrificed in this way. Now, the Greek gods, as I said earlier, had be, they behaved like human beings. They were capricious and fickle. They had human vices. Athens was filled with temples to these gods and goddesses who were arguing and competing among themselves. The Greek gods had love affairs with human beings. And this basically tortured the Greek people. They were constantly kept busy in an endless effort to try and please their gods. One of the most beloved goddesses, of course, was Artemis. She was worshipped across the known world, everywhere except in Israel. And uh, she caused a great deal of grief for Rabbi Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he went there. Uh, he had to deal with those merchants who were making idols of Artemis, and that's how they made their living. That was the part of their livelihood. And when Paul was there teaching about the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, it threatened their trade. And so they wanted to arrest him. They wanted him out of there because it was affecting their livelihood. And uh, as we read those accounts, of course, in the book of ha Acts, we see that uh, they said this great trade of ours is threatened. And they also said the great Artemis, the one who is worshipped across the entire world. And so that account in Acts, we're going to look more th at that next time, tells us that Artemis was widely worshipped. Now, she was the goddess over women and childbirth and over children. And so a Greek, uh, a Grecian a uh, young maiden who was preparing to get married would take all of her childhood toys, her dolls and other choice, toys, and she would sacrifice those to Artemis. She took those to the temple of Artemis, and she sacrificed her childhood toys to Artemis. And so uh, she did this before she got married. Before her wedding day, she was sacrificing her childhood toys to Artemis since Artemis was the goddess over childbirth. She wanted to be on good terms of, with Artemis so she could s conceive children in her marriage and bear children uh, uh, who would grow up to be super Greeks and continue worshiping uh, these Greek mythological gods. And so this is some of the history out there that we are dealing with in some ways even today. And of course, this was plaguing first century Israel at the time of the original uh, Hebrew believers. This was the understanding in the world across the entire known world at that time. And it's something that uh, Rabbi Paul had to deal with. He tangled with Greek philosophers. He confronted the merchants who were selling idols of Artemis. And so in every way, his battle was against this, these Greek beliefs and this Greek religion. And when we understand some of this history, the book of Acts makes a lot more sense because the book of Acts chronicles the battle that he had. I'm so glad you joined me today. We've learned a lot more about Hebrew versus Greek thinking and how to live as Hebraic believers. I'll see you next time.